Osio Nagad, Jennifer Lauren Dawado. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Lauren, Cherokee Nation citizen and host of Osio, Voices of the Cherokee People. Welcome to Chalagi, wherever we are. Of the many traditional crafts practiced by our people, pottery is perhaps one of the oldest. What was once a practical skill, creating utilitarian vessels for everyday use, has now evolved into an art form that celebrates the creativity of our people while honoring the innovations of those that came before. We'll start today's show with the remarks from Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Then we'll have a chance to speak with Chief Hoskin and ask him a few questions about the importance of perpetuating our traditional crafts, pottery being one. After that, we will watch a video highlighting Cherokee National Treasure Jane Oste's continued work, but also her efforts to pass her knowledge to the next generation. Next is our panel discussion, where we will welcome Deputy Speaker of the Council and Cherokee National Treasure, Victoria Vasquez, and a potter who is part of that next generation, Carrie Lind. And finally, we are excited to have Cherokee National Treasure, Robert Lewis, with us for a special storytelling segment. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin, Jr., for his remarks. Osio, for the Cherokee Nation, pottery is a rich tradition that reflects the deep history and culture of our people. The origins of Cherokee pottery, which serve both utilitarian and ceremonial purposes, can be traced back centuries. The pottery tradition is a testament to the connection between art, history, and our daily life. It's not merely a craft, but a reflection of the values of Cherokee community. Historically, Cherokee pottery was handcrafted using locally sourced materials, clay and natural pigments. The process involved a meticulous approach. Potters employed various techniques like coiling and pinching to shape the clay into functional vessels. These vessels served vital roles in everyday life from storing food to ceremonial practices. One distinctive aspect of Cherokee pottery is the use of intricate designs and symbols that have carried deep significance for our people over generations. The Cherokee pottery tradition is also a testament to our resilience and adaptation. Despite significant challenges, including the tribe's forced removal to Indian territory and cultural disruptions, Cherokee potters have preserved and revitalized their craft. Cherokee National Treasure Anna Sixkiller Mitchell is credited with reviving and growing the ceramic art form. She was a renowned artist known as a trailblazer and was widely accepted as an authority on both southeastern and eastern woodland style pottery. She is recognized for her pottery, but also for sharing her knowledge and skills with others. Today, contemporary Cherokee artists continue to innovate while staying true to their Cherokee cultural roots incorporating traditional techniques with modern technology. I'm so excited for our viewers to learn more about the creative process today. The history and culture of Cherokee pottery is second to none. It preserves our cultural legacy, tells stories through clay, and connects our history and our identity as Cherokee people. Wado. Wado Chief, and thank you for joining me today to discuss the importance of preserving our traditional crafts like pottery so going way back to our origins in the southeastern United States, many archaeologists have discovered pottery and pottery shards, which gives us a glimpse of our culture through iconography and the designs found. What is your take on the importance of those types of discoveries to Cherokee culture? Well, it's very important. Uh, and, and I'm not an expert in either art or archaeology, but uh, like many Cherokees, I have this love of our history. Mm -hmm. And so both from a utilitarian standpoint, what were these vessels for? What was going on with our people? I think it tells a story. But then uh, the artistic aspect of it, uh, to think about that uh, our ancestors were thinking about the world around them, depicting it in different ways ways, including pottery, and because pottery is so physically enduring, it continues on to this day. So I think that exploration is good, whether you're an expert or whether you're a layperson like me, and you just want to see more and think about what maybe your ancestors were doing uh, centuries and centuries ago. It is really fun to think about that. 
So as people may want to explore Cherokee pottery, maybe come here to Cherokee Nation to explore Cherokee pottery, where would you direct them to learn more about it and see the artwork? Well, where I, where I really direct people, particularly visitors, is to come to any of our art markets, including uh, the Cherokee Art Market, because it's an opportunity uh, to interact oftentimes with artists who are, who are there uh, displaying their art, selling their art, and then... Uh, purchasing that art for two reasons. One is, is something that you can treasure as a Cherokee, or if you're just an admirer of Cherokee culture and art and you're not Cherokee, an opportunity to purchase, but it also supports a Cherokee artist. That's something about uh, keeping art alive, perpetuating this art form. And so that's so important today. Of course, we have a number of museums where you can see uh, pottery on display. Uh, you can go to Tahlequah, our capital. You can go to our museum there. We have a number of other uh, facilities throughout the Cherokee Nation, including in my hometown of Anita, uh, where you can see these wonderful art forms. And so it's wonderful that we live in a day and age, Jen, where people can come to the Cherokee Nation. You can point them to art shows or our galleries, our museums, and, and even places places that you wouldn't expect it, like our healthcare facilities, just adorned with art, including uh, pottery. Yes. Um, and speaking of locations, the Anna Mitchell Cultural and Welcome Center in Vanita um, is dedicated to the Cherokee woman who is responsible for the resurgence of clay arts of our tribe. What is your impression of that? that spot. Well, I love this facility and it's personal to me and our First Lady January for so many reasons, not the least of which that it's in my hometown. But uh, what I really think about is Anna Mitchell herself. I, I knew her and if you know something about her, you know that she was this uh, very humble, very quiet uh, Cherokee woman who was also very powerful in her own way because she explored and educated herself on some art ways that had nearly been lost. And she brought those back. And if you want to think about the position she occupies, not only does the uh, this wonderful Anna Mitchell uh, uh, Center named after her, but she's a Cherokee national treasure in, I think, the truest sense of the word, because not not only did she become a master at this art form, she taught other people. I mean, and you, you've, I think, uh, uh, talked to some of these folks, young artists coming up who got their inspiration from Anna Mitchell. And I think about that facility. I think about little Cherokee boys and girls going in there and getting some inspiration, and they'll carry on this wonderful tradition. So it's a wonderful facility, uh, Route 66 in Vanita. Yes, and in fact, we'll talk to some of those potters who were inspired by Anna Mitchell coming up on the show. Well, thank you very much for being here, Wood Doe, for your time and for talking about this topic with us and for your leadership. Well, you may have noticed this beautiful piece of pottery that we are honored to feature on our set here on Chalagi, wherever we are. Well, now we get to meet the person who made it. Let's go to Tahlequah to the studio of Cherokee National Treasure, Jane Ostie. Following in her footsteps, Jane's granddaughter, Lily Van, is perpetuating the family craft. Let's take a look. We were just talking about that this morning. I'm showing her my crooked finger from working. <laughs> and she said, mine will probably be like that, as it will, in about 40 years. <laughs> uh, but I didn't start making pottery till I was 40, and she started at 14. I was going to Northeastern State University, and I had to take pottery and sculpture to finish my degree in fine arts. And I've been making pottery ever since. But I had been into it just a short time when I met Anna Mitchell, my teacher and mentor. So I learned both the, you know, the academic school way and from Anna, the native coil belt way and the way of firing. And anyway, she was my wonderful teacher and friend. And um, hopefully I've been Lily's teacher and friend. And <laughs> Absolutely. Do you remember the first spot you made? Yeah, it was about that big, maybe about that tall but I remember it had a spiral on the on the top of it then it went down the pot and then I did little cutouts on the side where the spiral ended her first show was Santa Fe Indian Market she went as a youth and shared a booth with me and she won her first place so you were 13 or 14 that year was 14 I guess when I first started like I just come and learn whenever 
the family came to town. So I just kind of did it sporadically. But <laughs> And then I guess when in middle school, I started coming consistently with the shows. And then I think until high school, I took some art classes, but we never went into clay work. Uh, right now, I'm working on some shields. I, in the last show, I focused mainly on pots, just bigger pots, but now I want to get into shield work. And this white clay is something that I'm not really used to, so I'm trying to figure it out. I hardly ever tell her anything now. She knows what she's doing. She might ask my opinion every once in a great while, but uh, <laughs> technically she knows what she's doing. I don't have to tell her how to do things. She could come in work all day alone without me. I've had a few students that could work that way, but not a lot. Most of them have to have a lot more attention for a lot longer time. So she's one of the fast learners. It's great, and because she's not afraid to be honest with me, like when something's going wrong, or I guess that's good. It's more of a, a loving way than just teaching at you. I try not to interfere with her creativity because she has some really good ideas that I haven't thought of, and newer, edgier ideas where mine tend to be more into the traditional, and I hope she never gives up pottery because I think she's really talented and could take it really far. And um, as far as success, I guess success would be getting in shows that she wants to be in and maybe winning. You know, that isn't all, all success is, but well, winning awards kind of gives you confirmation that you're doing something right. We have the Artist Recovery Act, too, through the Cherokee Nation, and they bought from both of us, and they will have another bid next, this next year, during the year, and that's something she can work toward also, and we're really thankful to our tribe for having that. It has helped a lot of people out. I never thought I could do it. <laughs> I don't know why I always had that doubt, but in the recent months or so it's been escalating pretty quickly yeah i just applied to the idol george museum show and then santa fe indian market and then i gotta turn in my application for the trail of tears show and but this year's gonna be trying to get in the shows and trying to produce some good stuff mm -hmm. i don't have many shows coming up i've I'm going to try and have something made for the Trail of Tears, and of course I'll do Cherokee Art Market. I will not be doing Santa Fe this year. After 30 years, I'm retiring from it. Uh, but I have several museum commissions at this time that I'm real happy about. I have a big pot over here on the right that's going to the McClung Museum at the University of Tennessee. And I also have a large fish pot over here that is going to the National Museum of the American Indian at Smithsonian, and that will be the third pot that they've collected from me. So I feel real honored that I'm in, in their permanent collection. Being in a museum is something I do want to accomplish in the future, so hopefully I can work towards that and make some good connections with the help of you. <laughs> She'll do well. Um, not recently, we had a show in Bonita, and the title was her own legacy, and I think that a big part of a person's legacy, in my case, is not the work I lead, but also the people that I can teach and that can continue the traditions. And uh, I have had several students that I think that's my real legacy, is being able to leave something like that that will continue. When I pass things on to others, I hope I can do it as well as you have and reach as many people as you have. And it's gonna to be tough, so I hope I can get some good tips from you. Wow, I love it, how talented they both are. It's so interesting to see the similarities, but also the differences in their approach and their finished pieces. A lot of talent there. Okay, next I'd like to welcome Cherokee National Treasure for Pottery, Victoria Vasquez, who is also Deputy Speaker of the Tribal Council, along with the ever-talented Carrie Lind, 
who is also a potter and culture and tourism coordinator for Cherokee Nation Businesses. Sio Nagat, and thanks, Wado, for being here today. Sio, thank you. That's great. We're thank excited. you for having us. Absolutely. So we'd like for this to be just an open discussion about the history and process and your personal motivations regarding pottery. So Deputy Speaker, I know your mother, Anna Mitchell, is accredited with a renewed resurgence of Cherokee pottery. Would you tell us what motivated you to take up pottery? And I'm sure your mother was probably a big influence, but what else? Well, she was. Um, but mother didn't start making pottery till I had already left home. I'd married and moved away, so I wasn't a part of watching her do it. But um, in later years, when I decided I wanted to try it, I knew I had some artistic talent, but I had never had time to pursue it because of life, yeah. you know, um, marriage, baby, job. And so when I was about 40 years old, which ironically is the same age my mother was when she discovered clay and started making pottery, I asked her if I could apprentice with her in her home for about a year, and that's what I did. And I didn't know if I could do it or not, but I wanted to try. So we were in her pottery studio the very first day, and we already had the clay ready to work up, and she's showing me how to build, and I started making a pot. And I thought, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so from then on, I just worked at it and practiced, and and I saw how how uh, what a great uh, impact she had made on so many people already. And um, I wanted to carry that forward because there was nobody else in our family doing it. And I knew, of course, she wasn't going to live forever. And so I'm just thankful that I got the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. What a great decision you made. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's an amazing story. Uh, we'd love it if you would share information about the Vanita Cultural Center and um, museum that's named in your mother's honor. What can we expect to find there? Special shows, demonstrations, classes? Okay, I can tell you um, some about it, and then I would like for Carrie to, to weigh in as well. Uh, I'm thrilled, of course, and the family is that it's named uh, the Anna Mitchell Cultural and Welcome Center. And you can expect to see a permanent exhibit of mom's works that family have loaned to, to the museum and other people have, have loaned or, or given. And uh, there are also some personal photographs that I, that I loaned them to put up, and they took, you know, took pictures. And so there's a, a, an array of the history of mom doing it, and it's a colorful, beautiful, beautiful exhibit. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I would like Carrie, though, to tell more about the classes and yeah. what else. Well, we also have a lot of um, Cherokee art that is a permanent part of the building that was part of putting that space together. Um, so, yeah, there are uh, there's a large art installation piece by Bill and Demas Glass. Um, Cherokee potter Tamara Roberts has some work in there um, and some other Cherokee artists as well. Um, and then also every six months we have rotating exhibits. So every six months will be a new art show with something completely different, different art forms um, to kind of share with the public. Uh, also, we have a lot of different history. We've had history courses there. We've had uh, Cherokee language classes that um, the Cherokee language classes were actually taught by uh, Anna's little brother, Dennis Six Killer. And um, we also have different kinds of cultural classes, basketry, we've had moccasin making classes, um, pottery classes, of course, that Victoria's came in and helped with. Um, and even some, show. yeah, the ribbon skirt <laughs> fashion show was a huge deal, a really big success that was amazing to bring there. So, so we have a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah so uh, if you haven't been there, I would encourage you to go. It's in Venita, Oklahoma, and it is a gem of a space for Cherokee Nation. Carrie, you are a very prolific younger artist, so what brought you to become a potter, and what is it about pottery that motivates you? Well, I discovered pottery after um, actually having a chance meeting with Victoria's mom, uh, Anna Mitchell, and um, I kind of fell in love with the woman before I realized that she had kind of single-handedly revived this um, art form. There was no one doing pottery in Oklahoma for like 130 years. Mm -hmm. And so after hearing the story of her growing up in boarding school, uh, which she actually grew up with my grandmother, she lost her language. But then 
but then her bringing back something that had been lost for 130 years was really inspiring to me. So after I discovered that, I wanted to do what she did. I wanted to dig where she dug her clay, and I wanted to do traditional firings. So I kind of went on a quest. And then um, once I touched clay, it was just like the world kind of disappeared, and, and I lost track of time. And so I always tell students um, in any of the classes that we have, if you lose time and you can kind of travel to that other place, that is what you're supposed to be doing. So wow. it's, it's, became, it's become therapy for me. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Yeah. So uh, what can you tell us about the history of Cherokee pottery? Let's get into that. Sure. Um, there is so much to be told, and so we'll tell yes. you a little tiny bit. But um, uh, over, well, I guess it was about 1000 AD when South Southeastern people were doing making pottery that far back that they're, you know, it sustained itself through burial mounds and things. So there are a lot of artifacts that, that could be studied. And um, she'd already mentioned that my mom re revived that art because after removal, the Cherokees that were moved to Oklahoma were unable to bring things with them that they were making pottery back back home. So by mother re reviving that art, she began in about 1969. Uh, and it took her, I would say, 20, 25 years to perfect um, the kind of art like this mm -hmm. that she did and attended, went to many shows and, and spread the word. People didn't even know there were Cherokees making pottery. And so there's a lot of history in just in Oklahoma. Right. And we have revived, I mean, there's a great revival of it now. We have probably eight or ten potters yeah. that are doing similar mm -hmm. things. So, yeah. was there anything you wanted to add? Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, not all tribes have pottery. So you really find, um, you really find pottery where people are permanently placed, like where they have settlements. Um, and we use pottery for all kinds of things. We used it for utilitarian purposes, for storage, for cooking. Um, and then we also uh, use them in ceremony and also, um, the, well, the most elaborate that you see are in burial mounds. So it was so important to us in our history that we created these, these pieces to send people on their journeys. And so, um, I think that the most interesting part of the history of pottery is you're actually writing history with these forms because it's not only the history of the people, but it's the history of the land too. So you have the, the land and, and the, and the people together and you kind of create this time capsule of the earth on the place that you're at at that time. So absolutely. It, I mean, we could go on and on about the history. It's always so great to hear all of that. You know, I think for a lot of us Cherokees, you know, we feel in our blood, it's our culture spoken through our ancestors and we see it right in front of us. It's, it's just so meaningful. Um, can we get into, um, you guys talking about the materials and pottery forms and all of those kinds of things and the processes that go into making pottery? Sure. Um, I actually brought some of the Vanita dry clay. These are this was found uh, in Oklahoma, in Vanita, in Craig County, where Mother dug her clay. And um, actually, a, 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 um, an uncovering of clay happened when they were banking the parking lot for the Anna Mitchell Cultural Center. And so several of us artists got to go and dig that clay before they covered it back up. And so we've got the, the natural clay, and then we have that clay that this is how it looks after it's processed. It's a little... This is, it has to be pliable. There are a lot of steps to processing. It's about a two-week... Uh, thing to do with the soaking the clay and straining it and waiting for it to dry and wedging it. But that in itself is a, is a tremendous feeling to know that you're just taking something out of the earth. Anyone could do it. It doesn't require a lot of money and a lot of tools. Most of our tools are handmade. Um, the things that you see here, we have, my mom used similar things to this paddle to form the outside of a pot and would use a, a smooth stone to form the inside. So really there were only about four tools when I learned you have a paddle and uh, your clay and your stone and your hands and then later design tools, um, things that are, that are made to carve mm -hmm. incisions on, which is what I would have done on this, this piece of pottery. 
And just quickly, I'll tell you, um, when Mother taught me, this is a model of how you actually form a, a piece of pottery from a flat surface to rolling the coils, stacking them, and then forming the inside, and then later pulling the outside together. This is how it looks when you start. And you can end up with any anything when so you start this. you start, start out with, like, you know, the pliable clay that you've processed, and you, mm -hmm. and you create those coils, right. and then you stack them on top and... Uh -huh. continue from And there. then you just start building. And what you do to, my mom was was known for mostly making pottery bowls and jars and traditional forms of things. And this is probably from the 80s. This was a piece of hers that I was able to um, retrieve from a, a collector for our family. We're so lucky to have it here. I know. And I, I'm lucky to have kept it because I, I, most of the things that I ever made have been sold and I don't have them anymore. So I was thrilled to get this, and Mother used a lot of uh, clay slip coloring, which is a liquid liquid clay of different colors. And so she did that that pot a long time ago. And then this one is a melon form on the bottom. She kind of segued into using melon forms a lot. And we are bird clan, so we both um, just love anything in a bird bird form. And when I started going to art shows, I decided I didn't want my pottery to look exactly like hers, so I decided I was going to work on effigies. I was drawn to animals and plants and people. Mm -hmm. And so I made this effigy bear. Um, I think it's beautiful. 1990. Oh, an N01. Mm -hmm. And it was in a, I found it in a Santa Fe store. It had been bought by them from an estate sale, and I purchased it back oh, wow. after I had sold it many years ago. So there's always a, a great history in, in our things. But Carrie has some interesting things, too, and I want her to talk about those. Um, yes. Well, I had I did bring one piece that was not fired, so you could kind of uh, tell the difference. Okay. But so this one is actually a pipe, but it's a little foot. Oh, how cute! <laughs> Isn't that yeah. Adorable? So um, so it's an effigy as well, but it's an effigy pipe. So. Um, but yeah, so th this is kind of the color that everything is until you fire it. And then like, if I were to fire this in an electric kiln, it would end up this color. Or but color. Yeah. when you fire, um, in a traditional fire, it kind of takes a color like this one here, where you see kind of the, the darker clouds from the smoke. So I brought that and then I brought, um, this piece which is actually kind of like uh, inspired by the cooking pots, mm -hmm. but it has seven handles for the seven different clans, and they're all connected all the way around the vessel, kind of holding up that one piece. So that was kind of the meaning behind it, but it's, it's all hand-built and traditionally fired. Gorgeous. So the process from start to finish can take, it sounds like weeks, really. Oh, really, probably a month or maybe even longer. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, these are such beautiful pieces. Thanks so much for bringing them and sharing them. You mentioned the firing process, but let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, in, you can use a kiln, but in traditional Cherokee pottery, we use the fire, right? Yes. Um, most of the pieces I make, I do use a traditional fire. And um, basically what that looks like is is an entire day's work. So, um, well, you, you would have to split all of the wood and you would start a ground fire and um, that would start around noon. And the first process of that is really, you're just, you're just starting a fire to kind of, um, to fire the ground itself before you actually ever even try and fire the vessels. Um, so you would start a, a fire on the ground and kind of let that ground dry out because if you were to put a, um, a dry piece of pottery and there were, was some moisture in the ground or even humidity, you know, to the, to the, to the ground, you would end up getting some um, trapped moisture and then you really risk breakage. Um, and so you would you would start the fire and then the vessels would go around the outside of that fire and you would kind of slowly, slowly, slowly inch those um, and turn them every so often just to kind of pre-fire them. Mm -hmm. um, and then more towards when the sun goes down is when I would rake out all of those coals that had been building uh, throughout the day and then the pots would actually go on top of the coals. 
and then um, I would take some smaller pieces of wood around the outside of that and I start the fire in a circle actually all the way around so that everything um, heats at the same consistency and then I just start to slowly stack closer and closer and closer to those vessels as slow and steady as I can, slowly increasing heat until they're all completely covered. Um, and that would happen at night. And so you're, you're looking inside of that fire, kind of trying to um, see when your pots, they'll start to glow orange, kind of like uh, a full moon. And so when you see that orange glow, you know that they've reached temperature. So you then you start to um, kind of back off and let that, that fire die down and let them cool at the same slow speed as, as you heated them up. Wow, that is a full day's work. It is. Yeah. Anything else to add about the firing process or? I would just like to say that um, my mom did a version of that, but it was not the open fire like Carrie does, but she had my um, dad build a three-sided sort of a concrete uh, pit, mm -hmm. and then she would fire with wood, but she would put her pieces in a metal tub and then put tin over it and build the fire on top and all around. I know how to do it, and I have done it, but because of where we live and uh, we have a risk of, we have high winds and mm -hmm. cattle, and my husband just really didn't want me to have that on the place, so I do use an electric kiln. So you can see the difference in the color. Mm -hmm. If I had take, if I take that and I want to make it dark, mm -hmm. then I would put that in a tub of dry pine needles, start the fire, and I can darken it. So there's just different ways of firing, and the if the end result is truly based upon how you fired it. A bit so, of a science, really. It is. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, this has been very interesting and an insightful conversation with such wonderful artists and cultural guardians. Um, we really appreciate your time here, Deputy Speaker and National Treasure Vasquez, and our artist and potter extraordinaire, Carrie Lind Wado, for sharing with us your own experiences in Cherokee pottery. Um, many of us are inspired by your creations, and I hear you're teaching a class soon. I'm going to try and take it. So um, it's very exciting, and good luck to you both and for all you do for the Cherokee people. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you. Awa. Okay, up next we have a very special treat. Cherokee National Treasurer Robert Lewis is here to share a story with us. Robert? OCO, my name is Robert Lewis. I'm here to tell you a story. A long time ago, when all the animals gathered together, each one of them was given a gift. They were given a gift because they went to the creator of everything because they were being kind and nice to each other. And the creator gave them each one something they wanted. Well, Rabbit wanted a little bit more. And Cherokee g stews Rabbit. So Rabbit went walking up to the creator of everything. He says, creator of everything, I would like some more gifts. And the creator of everything says, well, what would you like? The creator looks at Rabbit and Rabbit says, I want long, flat ears. I want to hear everything, especially what the women are saying about me. I know the women are talking at me because I'm so pretty. And the creator of everything says, oh, well, that's a powerful gift. And the Rabbit says, I'm not done. I also want to be smart. I want to be wise. And the creator says, well, that's a really powerful gift. In order to get those, you must prove something to me. Rabbit says, sure, what do you want? The creator of everything reaches down, grabs a bag, and hands it to Rabbit. Rabbit takes the bag and says, there's nothing in it. And the creator says, I know. I want you to fill it for me. Go out into the wilderness, find some red ants, fill up the bag with them, bring them back to me. But they must be alive, don't harm them. So Rabbit goes bouncing off into the woods. Rabbit finds this ant hill out in the woods and all the ants are working hard, just like you see ants working every day, they're hard. And as the ants are working hard, the rabbit comes walking up there and looks at all of them and lays the bag right beside the ant hill and looks at it and goes, hmm. The ants start working and they're watching. Rabbit goes, huh. Rabbit goes, hmm, 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 yee, yee, yee. Rabbit begins to dance. The ants all stop watching, and they're standing there, and they're staring. And as they're watching, the queen ant comes out of the ant hill and says, what's going on? Why isn't anybody working? Where's my food? And then here's Rabbit out there going, yee, yee, yee. The queen ant comes out and says, Rabbit. And Rabbit stops. Rabbit, what are you doing? Everybody stop working. Why are you dancing? Rabbit looks at the queen and says, dancing helps me think. I told the creator of everything that you could fill up my bag, but I'm looking at you and you're tiny and you're small. Look at my bag, look how big it is. You can't fill up my bag. The queen ant looks at that bag, goes, huh, we can fill up your bag, 
I'll prove it. I'll get all my ant people to come fill up your bag. All ant people, come fill up the bag right now. All of those ants come trucking on out of that anthill. They all go inside that bag. The bag begins to grow and fill up. And when the final ant goes inside and the queen ant goes and stands on top of all of them, the queen ant says, see, look at that. I told you we could fill up your bag. Rabbit says, wow, you did. I see that now. And then Rabbit wraps up the bag and goes back to the creator and says, Creator, here's your bag of ants. The creator opens the bag, looks inside, and the queen's at going, what happened? Let us out of here. And the creator says, I'll let you out in a second. Rabbit has work to do. Rabbit says, I want long ears. I want knowledge. I want to be wise and smart. And the creator says, you got to do two more tasks. And Rabbit says, well, what's the second one? The creator says, I want you to go out into the woods. I want you to find a rattlesnake, the biggest one you can. Bring it back to me alive. Rabbit goes back into the woods. Rabbit sees a huge sandstone. There's a rattlesnake down there sleeping. <laughs> Rabbit goes up there, sees the rattlesnake, takes a stick, goes nearby and begins to dry out and carve into the ground, shape of a snake. Lays the stick right beside it and goes, huh, that's not right. I got to do it again. So Rabbit begins to carve into the ground again. The snake hears somebody carving, somebody muttering, and the snake opens one eye and begins to peek out. Rabbit's carving into the ground the shape of a snake in a spiral and lays it by it and says, that's wrong too. The snake comes out. Comes up behind that third rabbit. Rabbit's sitting there carving again onto the ground. Rabbit snake says, Rabbit, what are you doing? The rabbit turns and looks and says, oh, I'm drawing you. I'm trying to show the creator that you're longer than my stick, but look at all my drawings. Look, you're shorter in each one of them. Rattlesnake looks at all the drawings. He says, oh, you silly rabbit. Tricks are for kids. I'm longer than that. I'll prove it. You draw me moving. Watch, move. So rabbit steps off to the side and the snake stretches out really long and really flat. When a rattlesnake stretches as long and flat as it can, the rattlesnake says, here, lay that stick against me. Rabbit lays the stick down and says, wow, that's impressive. You are longer than my stick. Rouse snakes, I know I'm impressive. I know I'm longer than that stick. You know how I know I'm impressive? Because every woman who sees me screams when they see me. That's because I'm so beautiful. Then Rouse snake lays his head down, smiling at how beautiful he is. And when he lays his head down, rabbit takes that big stick and boink, knocks out that snake and drags the rouse snake to the creator. Creator of everything, here's your rattlesnake. I want long ears and knowledge. And the creator looks at the rattlesnake, and the rattlesnake goes, oh, my head, it hurts. The creator touches the head of the rattlesnake, says, you'll feel better. I want you to sit right there. Rabbit has work to do. You have one more task to do, Rabbit. I want the biggest alligator in the world. I want it alive. Bring it back to me. Rabbit bebops off into the woods, finds this creek, sees across this creek, this huge alligator sleeping. Throws rocks in the water, ker-splash, ker-splash. Alligator wakes up, looks, sees Rabbit sitting there, motioning. So the alligator swims over, crawls up on the bank and looks at Rabbit and says, what do you want? Rabbit says, the creator of everything needs your help. The creator of everything is having a barbecue. Wants to feed all the animals. They're all hungry, but we can't get enough firewood. Beaver can't cut enough wood. Can you cut wood like a woodchuck, woodchuck wood? We really need your help. Alligator says, I can cut wood better than a woodchuck, woodchuck wood. I will help. So they go off into the woods. Rabbit points at a tree. What about this one? Let's cut this one down. So the alligator begins to chomp, chomp, chomp. Rabbit's watching. As the alligator chomps and works its way around the tree, Rabbit picks up a big stick and waits. And when the alligator comes back by, pow, smacks the alligator on the head. The alligator stops chomping and turns and looks and says, that didn't hurt. You're going to die. Rabbit looks at the alligator and goes, ah! Runs off into the woods. Alligator goes back into the water. Rabbit, when realizing that the alligator is not following, stops and says, Huh, that didn't work. I need a new plan. So Rabbit carves a mask from a buckeye tree, puts the mask on the face and hides the ears, peeks out, and goes back down to the water. Throws rocks back in the water. Ker splash, ker splash, ker splash. Alligator hears it, swims over, and looks at Rabbit. But what rabbit is sitting there looking at there with the mask on, that's all the alligator sees. So the alligator thinks it's a little person. And so the alligator says, what do you want, little person? Rabbit with the mask on says, hey, we sent rabbit to get you. 
We need firewood. The creator's waiting. Why aren't you helping? Alligator says, well, that rabbit hit me on top of my head. I catch that rabbit. That rabbit's going to die. So the rabbit with a mask on says, hmm, well, good. We don't need rabbit anyway. Come on. We still need firewood. Come help us. So they go out into the woods. They find that tree out there again. Alligator starts chomping again. Chomp, chomp, working his way around. Rabbit with a mask on starts to ask the alligator questions. Hey, alligator, that rabbit hits you on the head. Why did that rabbit hit you on the head? The alligator stops working and says, I don't know. Smack me on top of the head. Maybe he thought he could knock me out. I'm strong. I'm tough. He can't do that to me. He's just being silly. Chomp, 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 chomp. So rabbit with a mask on says, huh, trying to knock you out. Well, you are strong. You are tough. Alligator says, I'm also beautiful. Rabbit says, hmm, I guess there's no real way to knock out an alligator. Alligator chomps, chomps, and says, there is. You just got to spank my bottom really hard. Chomp, 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 chomp. Rabbit waits, and when alligator comes back around, takes that stick and wham, hits that bottom. Alligator goes, ow! <laughs> Rabbit grabs the alligator, drags it down into the woods, and says, creator of everything, here's your alligator. The alligator's rubbing the bottom, going, oh, my tail, it hurts. Ugh. Creator of everything touches the alligator and says, there, your pain's gone. You stand over there. Rabbit looks at the creator and says, creator, I've done what you asked. I want long ears. I want knowledge. Make me wise and smart. The creator looks at all that rabbit has done. The answer in the little bag, rattlesnake's over there, and so is the alligator. And the creator says, I think you have more knowledge than any other creature. But I will give you long ears. Come in here. And so when the rabbit comes near, the creator grabs the ears and pulls on them. <laughs> Ow! Rabbit says, you slap them together. Why'd you slap them together? So they can be flat. And you can hear better, says the creator of everything. Rabbit goes, ah, I can. That's good. Thank you. I'll gather more knowledge. And this is why all rabbits have really long, flat ears. When I go to area schools and communities and tell this story, I remind those children, pay attention. Listen. Teachers up there talking to pass down knowledge culture to you. You gather this knowledge. You listen to it. If you gather it, it will make you powerful. And that's what it is. Knowledge makes you powerful. But the key word is you have to listen. What do? There you have it. After hearing from today's guests, I think we can confidently say that the tradition of pottery is thriving amongst our people. Please join us again next month as we sit down again with Chief Hoskin and hear from several members of his cabinet about their important work. We hope you enjoyed today's show and thank you for being here. Hoa.